please help me in joining Lori Scruzzwood. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I need to apologize for all of you that had to wait for me to get here. Uh, anyone interested, I'll talk about it after the presentation. But thank you very much for, for uh, waiting. I'm here tonight to give a, a little talk on what happened back in 1982 when I was involved in the first expedition that Canada ever put together to try to put a Canadian on the summit of the highest mountain in the world. And um, I was hoping that there'd be some aspects of this presentation that have relevance to the challenges that all of you face working here in Alberta. And I feel a close connection to the, whoa, is that me? Am I standing in the wrong place with all that feedback? Here, I'll try standing a little further back from here. Uh, I was born in Alberta in 1949. I've lived here my entire, my entire life. And Southern Alberta has been my playground ever since I got a bicycle and could get out of Calgary. And uh, this part of Alberta, south of Calgary, I haven't spent as much time as I'd like to. So I'm hoping in the years to come to have a bit more time down in this part of the province. Now, what I'm here to talk about was what was involved when we went in 1982 to try to climb the highest well, let's see, how should we do this feedback? I mean, I can try talking without a microphone. What do you think? Can you pull Yeah, what do you think? Maybe if I stand further back? I don't know where I can go. How about here? We still get, are you getting a lot of ringing back there? Yeah, not bad? Okay, you can live with it. So, for those of you that uh, haven't figured out, that image on the screen right now is a picture taken from the south side of the highest mountain on the surface of this earth. It's approximately nine kilometers high, just short of 9,000 meters or for those of us brought up in the old English system, it's 29,107 feet above sea level. When we went to attempt it in 1982, the mountain had been attempted for over 62 years, from 1920 until 1982. And during that time, 128 people had reached the summit of the mountain. And in that time frame as well, close to 70 people had died on it. 67 or 68 people had died. Many of those were people that had made it to the summit but were killed on the descent. And so back in 1982, the odds were out of every three people that make it to the summit, you're virtually assured that one person won't come back from the trip. The odds were pretty stacked against you back in 1982. Since then, over 10,000 people have climbed Everest. About six years after we did the mountain in 1982, the mountain began to be guided. And now there's fixed ropes from both sides of the mountain going to the summit that are replaced each year. And the last time I was on Everest working as a guide was 2006, working with the British military from the north side, trying to repeat a route that we as Canadians had done in 1986. And we didn't get up the, the route in, in 2006. The Brits weren't successful. But in one month alone, the month of May, I saw 500 people summit Everest. And I'm explaining this so you understand that the nature of climbing this mountain has changed dramatically from 1982 when we attempted it for the first time and now. So instead of the odds being 50% that you're not going to come back from a trip like this, they've decreased to less than 1%. So for those of you that may have hidden in the back of your mind this idea that you want to go and climb Everest. There's never been a better time in the sense that it's, it's much safer to climb on Everest now than ever before. And in case you're interested, the going price these days is between fifty dollars and $65,000 for a trip to Mount Everest. Now, when we went, hey Mark, can you give me a glass of water or something? Thank you. When we went in 1982, the expedition cost $3 million. It took five years to plan, prepare, and organize. 
and the three million dollars came from 162 sponsors based primarily in Canada, the United States, and Europe that were willing to support this venture to put a Canadian on the summit of Mount Everest. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. So the initial part of this presentation is to try to explain how the heck we got all that equipment over there and what it took to execute this plan in trying to get someone to the summit. Before I go there, I should address the question of why would you want to climb Everest? A lot of people wonder if back in 82 the odds were so steeply stacked against you, why in the world would you want to go to a place like that? Well, Everest has a cachet to it. And to this day, people still flock to this mountain. It lies on an international border with the northern half of the mountain lying in Chinese-occupied Tibet, the southern half in a kingdom known as Nepal. And uh, my reasons for going, because it's really hard to explain why the other men on the expedition went, and on this expedition, 1982, there were no women skilled enough or who had enough high altitude experience to be on the expedition. Three years later, in 1986, we would go back to Everest and try to climb it from the north side. And on that expedition, there were two skilled and talented uh, women climbers, one of whom would eventually make it to the summit of Everest, becoming the fifth woman in the world to climb Mount Everest. But that would be years to come. Back in 1982, the only people we could find were a small handful of Canadians that had prior experience on high altitude mountains. The issue is that when you go above 10 to 12,000 feet, the air becomes less dense and the lack of oxygen in each volume or cubic meter of air being less causes severe physical problems as you get higher and higher. On the summit of Everest, there is only available to breathe one third the oxygen that we breathe here at uh, 3,000 feet above sea level. So the illnesses that we have to deal with are cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, pulmonary thrombosis, and retinal hemorrhage. So those are the four classic altitude illnesses that can make it difficult for you to go to the top. My reasons for going to Everest in 1982 were one, it was an honor to go and attempt the highest mountain in the world. I'd been climbing for 14 years prior to that, working as a mountain guide and as an instructor for the Canadian Outward Bound Mountain Schools. My second reason was I wanted to see if I could give more than my best. I'd learned how in 14 years of climbing to give my best at a sport that I truly love in an environment that I really love, which is the mountains. But I wanted to see if I could do more than that on a daily basis, do 110, 120, 150 percent every day of the trip. So for me, it was raising the ante up in a sport for me which had captured my imagination and my heart. And the third reason I went to Everest was I've been brought up in a military family and I've been taught that you're supposed to serve your country. And uh, I didn't feel drawn to the military. And so when this opportunity came up, I saw it as a way in which perhaps I, I could give something back to my country, some pride perhaps. In, and I didn't know if it was going to work but I felt that it was a good enough reason to go over there and try. So I had three compelling reasons to be on the expedition and three compelling reasons to stay on it as the problem started to unfold as we went there. So as I described earlier, this mountain at 29,000 feet above sea level or 9,000 meters is called Mount Everest. The name in the area that it's located in is Shomolonglu, which is Tibetan for Mother Goddess of the Earth. So the people that live in this environment see the mountain as something different, more than just being the highest mountain in the world. They see it as a symbol of the David spirit of this planet, the feminine spirit that keeps this planet in balance. And because of that, they have great reverence and respect for this mountain. And for better or for worse, that's how I learned to relate to it as Shomolungmu. To climb Everest back in 1982, you weren't guided on the mountain. Sherpas, the people we hired to work with us on the mountain, were hired for horsepower. I guess that would be the best way to put it. They live at those elevations. They've been on prior expeditions to this mountain before, so they don't need six weeks to acclimatize for their red blood cell count to double, which is what we, coming from North America, need to do. And so by hiring Sherpas, we had more muscle 
to get the gear on the mountain in the camps that we needed it in so we could make an attempt on the summit. But the mountain was not guided in 1982, so you needed a basic set of skills to be able to get up Everest. You had to be a rock climber, an ice climber, and a good mountaineer or alpinist, and then have applied that to high altitude climbing, peaks over 12 to 14,000 feet in elevation. So I'd learned how to climb here in, in Alberta, actually in the prairies, the boulders just west of Okotoks, those two glacial erratics made of quartzite. I learned how to get the basic aspects of the sport of rock climbing down pat by climbing on those boulders two to three times a week for the first year that I took up mountaineering. Then by taking those basic techniques of accuracy, precision, balance, getting your body to do what your mind conceives it able to do, I applied that to harder and harder climbs in the Canadian Rockies. This one here on the right hand side is South Hauser Tower, a peak in the middle of the Bugaboo Range in southern BC. You can take this sport to real extremes. This picture is taken in Yosemite, California, where 1,800 feet up a wall, the, the route up is blocked by a ceiling. So you traverse under the ceiling or overhang until you find a crack that splits that overhang. And then you jam your hands in the crack and pull yourself up and then slot your toes in the crack and twist them so they bite in there. And then you move on your way to the outer edge to kind of flip around and keep climbing. Now, it, it may look not very pleasant, and it's not. And we didn't get it the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth time that we tried it. We were down in Yosemite, California for seven weeks climbing. We got it on the sixth or the seventh try, and it was a, a really tough climb. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that in the sport of mountaineering and in rock climbing, you learn how to see things that at first look impossible, but make them become possible through teamwork, cooperative effort, imagination, creativity, and commitment. Ice climbing is another part of how you get up the big mountains on this planet. So to be able to move quickly, safely, and efficiently on ice, which mountains like Everest will have as one of their defenses, we learned to practice on frozen waterfalls here in Western Canada. Some of you might recognize the waterfall on the left-hand side. That's Takakaw Falls, highest waterfall we have here in Western Canada. It's about 1,000 feet high. That's what it looks like in the summer. And this is what it looks like right now. It's a frozen ribbon of ice about 1,000 feet high. So by practicing on frozen waterfalls, on stuff that's harder than we're going to do in the big mountains, we're able to move safely, quickly, and efficiently in that environment. We use specialized equipment like crampons, a metal framework of steel that you strap to your boots that allow you to walk on ice safely up to about 40 or 50 degrees in steepness. And then when it gets steeper than that, you face the ice and kick the claws in on the front of your crampons. And then your body weight is supported by those claws purchasing the ice. And then you work your way up the waterfall using some other tools. These things here are called ice screws. They're a stainless steel tube with heavy threads on some and thin threads on others machined onto the outside of the tube. The opposite end of the tube has steel eyes welded to them. You can either hammer these straight into the ice or start them and then thread them in. And they eat their way into the core of the ice. If they're placed in hard ice, they'll hold up to two metric tons, if you can believe that, over 4,000 pounds. If they're not placed correctly or if they're placed in rotten ice, they won't even hold your body weight. So it becomes important to study the medium upon which we're playing on this with. This is the normal technique for climbing a waterfall. Two of you will rope up to a rope that's about 60 meters in length. One of you will anchor him or herself to the waterfall with two or three ice screws so you can hold at least a combined weight of 5,000 pounds. That's the maximum energy generated when a body falls on steep terrain. Then the person who's going to climb first ties into the opposite end of the rope. The person who's staying at the belay stance passes the rope through a device on their harness called the belay plate and they feed it out with the idea being that if the leader should slip and fall, they lock the rope to their waist and in theory, the person going first will only fall as far below their belayer as they are above them. So here I'm 110 feet above my belayer, so it means I'll fall 220 feet until the rope comes into play, 10 to 20 feet of slacks, so that's 230, 10 to 20 feet of rope stretch, it's so around 250 foot leader fall if I come off when I'm 110 feet above my belayer. But that's not acceptable. So as I climb, I'll place in ice screws. 
thread them into the ice, clip a carabiner through it, snap the rope to there and keep climbing. So now if I fall, I think that's 40 feet below me. I'll only fall 40 feet till I'm level with it, 40 feet below it, 10 feet of slack, 10 feet of rope stretch. So that's a 100 foot fall if you come off 40 feet above your last piece of protection. I'm giving you this mass so that you understand that no matter which way you look at it, you're going to get hurt if you fall. So rule number one of these games we play in the mountains is that the leader doesn't fall, meaning you've got to be good enough at what you're doing so that you don't make mistakes. Now, not making mistakes in this environment is really simple. It's about paying attention to details. And details in this world are as simple as your level of physical fitness, the sharpness of your hand tools, ice screws, and crampons, properly adjusted to fit you, the quality of the safety gear that you're using, fleece clothing, Gore-Tex outerwear, insulated boots, crampons that are fitting your feet properly, wrist loops adjusted to the right length. You've taken the time and energy to study the waterfall that you're going to try to climb so that you can understand where the lines of weaknesses are in the waterfall and where the difficult sections are going to be. And then when it comes time to do it, you learn how to commit yourself totally without holding back. So the image on the left side was taken with a telephoto lens from the left-hand side of the cliff looking over. So that's, that's myself. My partner's belaying me in the cave. The waterfall is twice again the length you see there. Uh, that was on the last day. It took us five days and five nights to climb this waterfall. And we slept in caves and in hammocks that we attached to the ice as we were climbing. Now, the idea behind climbing is you get better and gear evolves and techniques evolve. And the last time I did this was 17 years ago with Sharon Wood, my friend who climbed Everest with us in 86, and we did it from the bottom to the top in seven and a half hours. So from five days to seven and a half hours, we were no fitter, but we learned how to climb better, more efficiently, and equipment had got better. So all of these things were working to our advantage in 1982 when we went to Mount Everest. I joined the expedition in 1981 as a climber, so I would have a shot at the summit and I also took on the role of assistant to equipment manager. So my job was to manage the gear that we had to get into the base of the mountain, which when we transported it from Canada totaled 27 tons. So we had 27 tons of equipment. There was 23 Canadians. And in base camp, Canadians included, we'd have a total of 67 people that we had to feed, clothe, equip, and take care of as we tried to get up this mountain. So it was a big expedition. A couple months earlier, three of the Canadians and myself went to Everest to get all that gear in before the main team would arrive. Then we flew back to Canada after five weeks there in Nepal, and then in late July, we flew to Kathmandu to start the approach into Mount Everest. The closest you could get to Mount Everest from the capital city of Nepal, the kingdom in which the southern half of Mount Everest lies, the closest you could get by road is to this village called Lamasangu, and from there, it was a 260 kilometer overland approach on trails to get to the base of the mountain. So when people have asked me a million times, so how do you get fit to do these mountains? Well, back then in 1982, just walking into the mountain would get you into a pretty good state of physical fitness. It was 260 kilometers, 21 days of trekking, and it was during the monsoon season, so the worst weather of the year. The first two thirds of the journey are across the grain of the land, because the mountains in the north, plains are to the south, so water drainage is north to south. So you're going over the grain of the land and then in line with it in the last third. You climb 49,000 feet, descend 37,000 feet, and as I said, take three weeks to cover that terrain. And it covers all types of terrain, plains, lush green jungles, rice paddies, rivers, high mountain passes that quite often we would camp at because when we get there at the end of the day, it would be overcast, raining, misty, but in the morning, the mist would be down lower in the valley so you could get a glimpse of where you're headed. Because once you started the day and drop down into there, you're in torrential rain, day in and day out. Now, that's not so bad, except that over there, there's a lot of, it's not just the rain and the mud and, and that sort of stuff, but there's blood sucking leeches everywhere. And I know for those of us that come from Alberta, that looks like an earthworm. It's not a big deal, what's there to be scared of? Well, nothing to be scared of when they're that size, but once they get on you. So what they do is they're on blades of grass, leaves, trees, moss, they're in the water that you're wading through at night and on the ground you sleep on. 
in the evening. And they have heat sensors on either end of their body, and they extend their, their sensors out and latch onto you as you brush by, or fall on your umbrella, and then flip-flop over the umbrella, and then dangle on the edges of the umbrella to get onto you. And then they move over your body like a slinky coming down a set of stairs, from one end to the other, flipping over themselves, so they can access some thin skin, like behind your ears, side of your neck, between your shoulder blades, under your armpits, behind your knees, edge of your ankles, and other areas. And then they uh, inject an anticoagulant into your blood, so it won't clot, and a painkiller, so you don't feel it, and then they suck on your blood for six to eight hours. And uh, after they've been on your body about six hours, they're about the thickness of a, a man's thumb and twice as long. So they're hideous things. They're just awful. And we had them for the first two weeks of the approach getting into the mountain. Now, on this expedition, we got to remember, too, that uh, there's not a lot of facilities to take care of you. Like, you know, if you've got to go to the bathroom, you take your pack off, crawl into the jungle, do what you got to do, get back on the trail, keep moving. And remember, these things, they got no pride. They don't care where they attach themselves to. And luckily or unluckily, depending on your perspective, I was the only, only Canadian who smoked cigarettes on this expedition. And I've been raised on war films. And a lot of my heroes, I'm not recommending it, and I didn't raise my daughter that way, although she did like The Great Escape. Um, I was raised on films like African Queen with Humphrey Bogart, Operation Burma with Errol Flynn, and uh, Merrill's Marauders. In these films, there's always blood-sucking leeches, and the way the heroes get them off is they light a cigarette and burn them off. So that's what I did. I, I didn't mind getting these things because I could torment them to get them off my body. And, uh, and because I was the only Canadian who smoked, I was constantly being asked by other Canadians who hadn't paid attention when they were going to the washroom to help get these things off. And by the time we got into base camp three weeks later, not only had I run out of cigarettes, but I'd gotten to know some of the members way more personally than I'd ever intended <laughs> when I started this expedition. After two weeks, we were climbing above 12,000 feet above sea level. So now we started experiencing more of the monasteries and the religious beliefs of the people over there. So they're, they're Buddhists, Tibetan Buddhists to be exact and we need to go through ceremonies for our Sherpas. We had 30 Sherpas, so they felt they had protection on the mountain. And this was at one monastery called Tangboche Monastery. And the Rinpoche would bless us, give us a good luck scarf, a handful of blessed rice, which we're supposed to carry with us. And, and in situations of danger, take a few grains of rice out and sprinkle it around, and it would pacify the elements of danger and give you a better chance of getting through. So none of us Canadians were practicing Buddhists. And none of us actually believed this stuff. But I noticed that when we leave the monasteries, nobody was getting rid of their good luck scarves. Nobody was getting rid of their blessed rice. And later on on the mountain, when we'd be in difficult scenarios and the Sherpas were throwing the rice around, I saw Canadians and myself doing it as well. And I don't think it's so much that we embrace their beliefs, but we did admit to ourselves they've lived here for over 1,200 years. Maybe they know something we don't know. And if uh, carrying a good luck scarf and Carrying blessed rice will help. Give me a bucket full. Eventually, the last 30 to 40 kilometers in, we used uh, yaks to get our gear into base camp. And I uh, love these animals. They're more intelligent than most of the climbers I met over there, including myself. They don't need to be guided on glaciers. They find their way. And uh, when you finally do arrive at base camp, this is what it looks like. 17 and a half thousand feet above sea level. So about a thousand and a half feet lower than the summit of the highest mountain in Canada, Mount Logan. And that's the bottom of the mountain. And from there, you still have close to eleven and a half thousand feet to climb to get to the top. It takes us a week to prepare the site because it's been used for over 30 years on this side of the mountain by other expeditions. And so there's a lot of garbage and there's a lot of stuff left behind that isn't very good. So it takes us about seven days to clean up the mess and make our home there because we're going to be there at least for the next 60 days. Now, if I go back to that picture there and explain to you, in the background is the Kumbu Glacier coming down from Everest, Lhotse, and Nupse. Drops 2,000 feet here to the camp, then makes a sharp right-hand turn and goes nine miles in that direction. If we look out at a 45-degree angle four miles away, we'll see a tall peak called Kalapatar, around 18, 19,000 feet high. If we go over there, climb it, and then look back in this direction, this is the view from Kalapatar. Base camp located here on the lower left-hand corner. Everest in the background, <clears throat> 29,000. Nupse here around 28, just a little bit below. And then a peak hidden behind Nupse called Lhotse, sister peak to Everest. 
Those three peaks, Everest, Lhotse, and Nupse, form a huge bowl that snow avalanches down into, collects the pressure, the thickness of the snow gets two, three, four, four hundred feet, I think, and turns that snow into a plasticine-like form of ice. And gravity pulls it down, and here you see the Kumbu Glacier popping out at this point, descending 2,000 feet, breaking apart, that's called the Kumbu Ice Ball, and then turning and making a descent of nine miles to the right-hand side. So that's where our base camp was located. This is the majority of our team in base camp. Again, 23 or 21 Canadians, 30 Sherpas, a sort of base camp personnel, cooks, cooks assistants, liaison officers, mail runners, totaling 67 people in all on the expedition. Food and alcohol laid out on the table. What for? Well, ostensibly to make an offering to the spirit of the mountain, Shomolongmu. Then if there's anything left, you eat the food, you drink the alcohol, and that's called the consecration of base camp. There's a mass erected in the center of base camp upon which are four ropes stretched out on the four points of the compass. Much like Nor North American native beliefs, the four directions carry a lot of weight over there in Nepal. The east for new beginning, new awareness, the south for the heart, the west for death, the north for power and community. And so Sherpas write their prayers out on flags and hang them on those four points of the compass. And they do all that long before we start heading up the mountain. First order of business is to make sure the gear is ready to start moving up the mountain in the order in which it's going to be needed. So the man in charge of that is this man here. His name is Peter Spear. There's always the argument on expedition as to who the most important person is on an expedition. Is it the expedition leader? Is it the deputy leader? Is it the person who makes it to the summit first? My, my vote is that it's always the base camp manager because he's in charge of logistics. His job is to ensure the right gear is in the right place at the right time. And if he doesn't do his job properly, the rest of us can't do ours properly either. The men in the background are in white, one of two doctors we had. In red, all the climbers that have a chance of going to the summit are dressed in salopettes and red tops. So that's their secondary role. In this case, working with Peter Spear to get the gear moving up the mountain. So all the people you'll see following are climbers, and you're seeing their secondary role. So these two men here, Jamel Zinga and, God, I'm forgetting the names now. Don Searle, um, two lead climbers, but their secondary role was to test all the oxygen bottles for pressure, the regulators for functioning, and the masks for functioning, which once assembled would create a 23 pound unit, which would keep us alive above 26,000 feet on the mountain. And they found that half our bottles had leaked in transit. They were pressurized to four and a half thousand pounds per square inch. And there was only a couple places in the earth you could get that done and then still transport it by air. So unfortunately, where they were done, they used the wrong sealant. So we only had half of our oxygen available for use higher up on the mountain. These men here, lead climbers as well. Dave Reed and, ah, I'm sorry. I'm forgetting names these days. Separate from their, their responsibility of trying to get to the summit, their secondary role was not just assembling, but throughout the expedition, maintaining the stoves we would use, not to cook food, but to, to get water. Because above base camp, there is no water. There's just ice and snow. And above base camp, you will need between seven to nine liters of liquid per day to simply stay alive and hydrate. That's not to brush your teeth, shave, wash your hair. That's seven to nine liters of liquid you got to get in your system. And that's all got to be melted from snow and ice. So critical to our survival up high was the functioning of these stoves. Uh, this man here, our CBC film cameraman, uh, his secondary, his main role was record the expedition. His secondary role was maintain communication so that we could assess where we were on the mountain at any given time relative to our planning, our scheduling, and our deadlines because we only had about 60 days to do the mountain in. And by the end of the first week and the beginning of the second week of October, the winter winds and the winter snow would start to arrive. So we had to be done and off the mountain by that time. And that's why effective communication was important. So we stayed on to our schedule. Everybody got the same gear, backpacks, ice axes, sleeping bags, down parkas, plastic boots, crampons, watches, Everybody got the same gear, about $3,000 worth of gear per person, 67 people to outfit. So, you know, it helps explain where that $3 million went 
to fund an expedition of this size. All the gear that we used was state-of-the-art. These plastic boots, which you see here, we still use plastic boots in this day and age, but back then in 1982, they were state-of-the-art. They just become available at the beginning of 1982. So this picture was taken in August of 1982. Everyone on the expedition had plastic boots. We had Gore-Tex one-piece suits filled with down, down sleeping bags, super gaiters, over boots. We had the best gear money could buy, but it's worth mentioning that in the end, in this world anyway, the world of mountaineering, it's not the gear that gets you up the mountain. It's nice to have efficient equipment, but in the end you just don't put on your one-piece climbing suit, your Gore-Tex gloves, your Barney sunglasses, strap on your titanium crampons and pick up your aluminum ice axe and then say, up James, and then you're floated to the top of Everest by the god of gear, floated down. Just the image of that is ludicrous and we all know it doesn't work that way. Much like perhaps in your own field of endeavor, the way things get done is by the individuals that make themselves get up in the morning, that achieve the goals set for that day. And a lot of times you're not in top form. You're sick, you didn't rest at night, you're feeling the effects of altitude. But in this world, it is and always will be the individuals working together as a coordinated team which gets the job done. Equipment allows us to be more efficient, but in the end it doesn't do the job for us. Gear that we could not buy commercially, we actually had to make ourselves. We had camps up high in the mountain, or would have camps up high, that were on terrain so steep that you couldn't put a normal tent. So we had to create platforms which disassembled you could carry in a backpack. The pieces all came apart. But once you assemble them, and I think we had one, two, three, four, five, so we had ten plywood panels that were fitted in this outer frame, with locked down on it, then used steel cables from the four corners and tightened them with turnbuckles to make a solid platform. And then what you did was you anchored one side of that platform with ice screws on the side of the mountain and adjusted the outer edge with legs so it leveled out. And then we put these bulletproof tents on top. They were made out of ballistic nylon. Not because we thought anyone was going to be shooting at us, but because this was set up on terrain where there was ice and rock falling off the mountain. And you had to be able to sleep in these things at night without feeling you're going to be killed because a piece of ice hits it. I know it looks like a chuck wagon, that's because it was designed in Calgary. And all I know is they worked. They worked really good. They were heavy, but they worked. Uh, we had one small problem in that only one third of the Sherpas spoke English. So we needed seven days to work with them to, to get the ones who did speak English to translate for the others what the operating procedures were we wanted everybody to adhere to on the mountain so we could better ensure, hopefully, all of us getting off the mountain alive. And while that was being done, I worked with four Canadians in finding a route through the Kumbu Icefall. So, 100 meters from where this picture is taken, you can see two people moving on the glacier. Higher up here, you wouldn't be able to even distinguish them, they're just going to be a dot. So it's 2,000 vertical, 4,000 linear feet to get to the site of Camp 1 at 19,200 feet. It took us four days to find a route through here. We used 72 aluminum ladders. 10,000 feet of 9 millimeter caving rope and hundreds of anchors to fix a route through here. And then we began the task of moving the gear that had to go to Camp 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. First of all, getting that gear to Camp 1. So we would do that by getting up each morning at 1.30 a.m. The main group would have breakfast, two of us would set off on reconnaissance. Um, I found the hardest thing for me on Everest in 82 was laying in the tent, worrying about what was coming. So I always volunteered to do reconnaissance. I'd rather be doing something than thinking about it because sometimes your mind can work against you. So every single day I did reconnaissance and they changed the guy who would come with me. So we'd leave at 1.30. We'd climb for an hour. Then about 1,000 feet above base camp, we'd check out conditions. If it looked good, we radiated down for, a, for the main team to start moving up the mountain. If it was no good, we'd return back down and they'd go back to bed. So on a, a plus day, what would happen is the men who had then had breakfast and were ready to go at 2.30 a.m. would shoulder their loads anywhere from 35 to 55 pounds, put their headlamps on, they got 25 pounds of clothing and equipment on their bodies, and then move for four hours through darkness until it got morning light and then a few more hours after that. Why at night? Because that's when it was the coldest and the glaciers coming down the mountain at about one to two meters a day. So when it's colder, in the middle of the night, the glacier is moving less. And so we were trying to keep the odds in our favor as best you can. 
So we climbed for four hours till morning light. When it got light, I kind of wished that it'd stay dark because at least when it was dark, you'd only see as far as your headlamp would throw the light. Now, when you could see where you were, you realize it wasn't a very enviable place. This is the site of Camp 1 at 19,200 feet. We put up one tent, dug a pit, put the gear in the pit, covered it up, checked what lay ahead. That's Lotse, Sister Peak to Everest, Everest above us on the left, Nupse above us on the right. But we're not going anywhere, and we're not staying here because we don't have enough red blood cells in our system to sleep there. If we tried to sleep there, we probably would die in the night from cerebral edema or pulmonary edema. So we turn around and head back to base camp. And the strategy is climb high, sleep low, climb high, sleep low, climb high, sleep low again and again until you've stimulated your skeletal frame to produce more red bone marrow, which is red blood cells. And over a three to six week period, you're gonna double your red blood cell count. That is what will allow us to function at higher elevations. But until we're there, we can't stay at these camps. So we head back down to base camp. We get a bite to eat. We get maybe three to four hours of sleep. We're up again the next morning at 1.30, usually at 1.10 for me, because I got to get geared up. And then one hour reconnaissance, so you set off to see how things are. And if it looks like it's positive, you're ready down for the main team to come up. At some point, you'll stop if you were on reconnaissance. A lot of thermos, because you haven't eaten anything since dinner the night before. And even then, it wasn't much that you'd eat. So you pour yourself a coffee or tea, sit back, and collect your wits. Now, what it would look like from below, looking down, is first of all, you smell a sweet smell. And that's the Sherpas who would burn incense before leaving. But these guys are professionals. They're not lighting little tiny sticks and glowing in the dark. They get an incense bush and set fire to that sucker. You smell it 3,000 feet up the mountain. And then, in terms of saying their prayers, they don't hedge their bets either. You know, most of us brought up here, you know, we'll say our prayers, you know, please don't let me die. I did that every morning. And then we get on with it. These guys, they'll, they'll choose a prayer, like a common one is, Om Mani Padme Om. It's about the sacred lotus. And then they'll say it 10,000 times out loud. Oh, money, pub me, oh, money, pub me, oh, money, pub me, oh, money, pub me, oh, all morning. And you get 30 Sherpas going, oh, money, pub me, oh. It's like a humming noise. Then you see the headlamps as they're coming in the darkness. So it looks like a serpent, one headlamp behind another, slowly weaving its way up the mountain. Now, these pictures here were taken with a flash on the camera, so you can see the background. But normally, as you look down from your perch sitting on your pack drinking a cup of tea, all you see are disembodied beams of light. So you can't really tell who's who. The way I would tell is that I'd know it was a Sherpa because I'd see the light bobbing along at a fairly good pace. They were fully acclimatized. When the person would get to the edge of the crevasse, they wouldn't even hesitate. I'd see a hand shoot in front of them in the beam of their headlamp and see rice fly out of their hands and shoot across the bridge. And then I'd hear, oh, money, pub me, oh, money, pub me, oh, money, pub me, and they cross the bridge and they'd move on. And the next shirt the same thing, and the next shirt the same thing. And then you'd see a headlamp coming along, probably a Canadian, because it's moving a little slower. You can hear heavy breathing, you don't hear prayers. And when the headlamp gets to the edge of the crevasse, you see the beam of light stop, look down, then you see it look up, look down again, look to the left, look to the right, look ahead again, look behind them, then you see a hand go in a pocket, rice go flying across the ladder, and then you see them very slowly crossing over the, these ladders. The first half a dozen times that I was up there, a number of those I crossed on my hands and knees because it was way too intimidating. But eventually, as the days turned into weeks, we would move over them as nonchalantly as the Sherpas were doing. They've been doing this for decades. We never use these techniques in Canada or in South America because we're never on a mountain as big as Everest. So Everest demands different techniques. How do you explain what it feels like climbing there? Well, you're in darkness. You feel the lack of acclimatization and it's not in its serious forms like cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, pulmonary thrombosis. The way it manifests is it makes you feel like you got the flu. So headaches, nausea, lack of appetite, inability to sleep at night, and your joints ache and just no energy. Then you get up in the morning, in the middle of the night, you put 25 pounds of clothing, climbing equipment, boots, crampons, harnesses, and helmet, and ice axes on. Then you shoulder a 35 to 55 pound load. Then you turn your headlamp on, and you go out, and you start crossing bridges that are tied together in the middle so they sag. There is no solid support on either side, so you have to balance across holding on to a rope that will give. You're clipped into it so that at least you won't fall to your death, but it still is quite intimidating. And then you do that day in and day out as you move up the side of the mountain. 
Back in Canada, when you look ahead to see where your friends are, usually it's motivating because soon I'll be there. On Everest, it doesn't work that way. You look where your friends are and it looks worse than where you are. So you stop thinking about it and end up just focusing on moving efficiently and quickly to minimize the time you're exposed to these hazards. This is what you don't want to see when you get to Camp 1. This picture was taken at 10.30 or close to 11 in the morning. The sun is high in the sky. The temperatures were around 30 degrees Celsius. Now you might go, how is that possible? You're on ice that's, what you say, 400, 500 feet thick. There's snow all over the place. How cold is it at night? Eh, it's 10 to 20 below at night. So how can it be 30 degrees plus centigrade in the daytime? Because the radiant energy of the sun is so strong without a cloud blocking it, that temperature skyrockets. And there's a cold sink of three, four, 500 feet of ice. So it, the ice stays there. The snow gets a bit soft, we're throwing snowballs, but basically you're cooking outside. And so you want to be at Camp 1, get rid of your gear, and heading back down before 9 a.m. So I'm just showing you a picture so you get an idea of what it's like up there. When you're coming off the mountain, you're trying to beat the heat. So where you've climbed up a ladder before, you don't down climb the ladder. I know it looks like that guy's doing it, but he's not. He's clipped into one of these two ropes. He's got a loop of it passing through a device on his harness called a descender or descendure. And then by jumping off, he's sliding down the rope like a fireman coming down a fire pole, controlling the rate of descent with the friction he applies to that device. He slows down as he nears the bottom, hits the bottom, unclips, clips into the next rope, and keeps running until we get to base camp. And there in base camp, we had three priorities. My cue to have a sip of water. First is rehydrate. Second, treat your sunburn. And third, and at this stage, you know, years later, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, but it was the reality. Your third priority was avoid the base camp manager. Because that guy was like the devil. As soon as he'd see somebody coming off the mountain, his normal response was, Lori, good to see you. Hey, listen, I got some stuff that needs to be done. Thinking that, oh, you just come back from a stroll. Meanwhile, you're absolutely depleted, low on blood sugar. You're burned out. The last thing you want to do is start lugging boxes around for Peter Spear. So you tried to sneak back to your tent and maybe get an hour of rest, and it was time for dinner, a bite to eat, a couple hours sleep, get up the next morning, repeat the same process. So we did that for the first 23 days of the expedition. And most of us couldn't take it for more than five days at a stretch. So on the sixth day, we take a break, spend a day in base camp, rest, recuperate. I'm the only one who shaved. Everyone else was growing a beard. I shaved because I'd learned that I were bound this one little rule. And that was that if you looked like your act was together, people kind of felt that your act was more together. And you weren't any more together than anyone else, but it helped instill a bit more self-confidence. So I knew that I had to watch my attitude on the mountain. I had to maintain my attitude. So try to clean myself each day, wash my clothes so I had something clean to put on at the beginning of each day, shave my face every day so I looked somewhat reasonable. Uh, worked for me. It helped me maintain my attitude throughout the expedition. The day in base camp went way too quick. We could rest, recuperate, get some food, write some letters home, get some letters from home, because the mail runners were doing a five-day circuit. What took us 21 days, they did with nothing but mail and they'd stay in tea houses. They wouldn't have to carry anything. They'd get out to Kathmandu in five days and run back in five days. So the four of them, not doing it together, had us getting fresh mail every five days in base camp. It was amazing. And once that day was over, you were back up on the mountain. And eventually, the days turned into weeks. We got acclimated enough to move up and occupy the site of Camp 1. So this is what Camp 1 looks like when you're living it. That's a 12-hour snowfall on this tent, 12 hours, these have just been cleared out. So more than 24 hours, when it's snowing heavily, the tents get completely buried. In each of those tents is another tent, so as most of you know, double wall tent to insulate from the cold. And then in each of those is two men. So I'm not so sure how often you've ever gone to an apartment or a house where two guys are living together, but usually it's messy. So imagine these tents, you're in them for 14 days at a stretch before you come down for a two-day break. And in that tent, you've got to cook, eat, entertain, sleep, kill time, read. This is your home. And guys being normally messy, it gets even messier. And then if that ain't bad enough, by now we're noticing Sherpas are using a hell of a lot of spice and raw onion and raw garlic on their food. And so we ask them why, and they say it helps you acclimatize 
and keep your immune system strong so you don't get sick. So we're throwing rice around. We got good luck scars wrapped around our throat. We're halfway in the swamp. Might as well go all the way. So we start eating our garlic. We start eating raw onions and heavy spices. So you got to understand now. At night it's 10 to 20 below. So when you go to sleep with two guys in these tents and wake up in the morning, there's about one to two inches of hoarfrost lining the tent from the moisture of your breath condensing on the walls of the tent. That's garlic scented hoarfrost. And then as you start your stoves to melt snow and ice to get liquid, and when the sun breaks the horizon and starts warming the walls of your tent, this hoarfrost starts to melt. And it gets in your hair, gets in your down clothing, gets in your sleep bags and on the floor of the tent. Now imagine that cycle repeating itself 14 times. And then when you hear people giving climbers credit for being brave or courageous to go out and face what they have to face each day. I tell you, when I'm on the, the mouth of these tents and I'm putting on my boots, you know, I'd rather be outside facing death and danger because if you turn around and look at the mess inside these tents, it's more frightening than anything that awaits you out, outside. So I don't take to heart any of this credit many of us get for being brave. Now when you see that kind of snow being here in Alberta, you know it means avalanches. And avalanches are the are the thing that contributes the highest amount to death in mountaineering accidents in Nepal. The highest percentage of climbers killed in mountaineering accidents in Nepal are from avalanches. And we were no exception to that terrible statistic. On August the 31st, when a group of 12 of us were carrying gear from base camp to camp one, an avalanche released off the west ridge of Everest and it buried five of our members. We were able to get two men out, rescue them, get them to base camp, they survived. The other three we searched and searched only found the body of one man after two hours of searching. The other two men we never located. The man we did find was dead. So we brought his body off the mountain. Those three men killed were Sherpas. And two days later, we carried the body of the one man we were able to retrieve out to a village 14 kilometers away called Dugla. And there he was cremated. And there the expedition leader met the parents, <coughs> the wives, and the children of the three Sherpas who had been killed. And while he was there, that's Bill March, our expedition leader, trying to comfort these family members at this time of ter terrible loss and grief. He got the news that a second accident had happened on the mountainside. This time, an area known as the Traverse, an area the size of a football field that had not moved in the previous couple of weeks. And when it did move on that day, it actually collapsed on itself and, and went down 20 to 30 feet, breaking aluminum ladders and bridges like toothpicks and snapping ropes like they were pieces of thread. And at the time, five men were working in that, that area, repairing a bridge. Four of those men miraculously survived, and one man did, did not. And that was Blair Griffiths, our CBC film cameraman from Vancouver, British Columbia. When the expedition leader heard that Blair had been killed, he said, that's it. Four men killed in three days, everyone off the mountain. Don't bring Blair's bodies down, just get everybody off. It's too dangerous to be up there. So we had to repair the section of the ice fall that had been damaged so people could get down, and then a handful of us realized that if we were off the mountain for a week to two weeks, Blair's body would get completely covered. He wasn't buried in an avalanche, he'd been pinned between two ice blocks, between two ice blocks, we could see his body. So we decided to carry his body down against the, the orders of the expedition leader. And uh, the expedition leader in the end was proven correct. Three of us got injured in bringing Blair's body down. Two Sherpas and myself went into a crevasse. I broke three ribs on my right side. They got injured as well. I was helped off the mountain, taped off them, put into a tent where I would lie for two weeks. The other two Sherpas left the expedition. They were injured too severely. In the days that followed, the mobile members of our team carried that Blair's body to that same village of Dukla, and on a hillside where the remains of other climbers are buried, there Blair was cremated. And when the main team returned to base camp at the end of that day, seven of our Canadians decided the risk wasn't worth the reward anymore and they decided to leave the expedition and go back to Canada. Two-thirds of our Sherpas refused to go back up the mountain because they felt the expedition was infected with bad luck. So that left us with one-third of our Sherpas, 10 Sherpas, and about 13 Canadians who were willing to go back up on the mountainside. So what we did was we, and where's my video guy? So when I finish with this slide, we're going to put just a couple minutes of that videotape up, okay? So what we did was we sat down and we assessed how much gear had we carried to Camp 1? <clears throat> how many people did we have to do this with? How much did we need for the route we came to do? And it was simple math. 
it, it didn't add up. We didn't have enough hard resources and we didn't have enough human resources. So we needed to change the route. So we applied to the Nepali government for a change of route. And seven, eight days into the storm that was keeping us trapped, we received approval to try this different line. And what was happening was back in Canada, this expedition was being perceived as a disaster. And I thought it might be helpful just to show you a couple of clips from that time frame. So I'm going to make a black screen. And I hope you'll be able to hear it. We might have to adjust the volume. Hopefully this is going to work. We tried to do it. The, the footage, by the way, is from um, a CBC documentary that I worked on in 2006. And uh, it's a good documentary, about 53 minutes long. And this is just a short clip from the middle of it. I went back to Everest 25 years after we did it. Oh, you can start at any time. Oh, are we waiting? Yeah. I'll let you do it. I don't want to mess it up. And uh, there's a young, attractive woman in the picture. That's my daughter. And the ugly guys are those of us that summit. It's really hard to explain until so we actually go up there. And can we turn it up? It's pretty easy. This is uh, Everest Base Camp. Everest Base Camp calling Kathmandu Earth Station. After Blair's cremation, the team gathered at base camp. There were heated discussions about whether it was worth continuing. Ultimately, each man had to make his own decision to stay or to go. That's it. Yeah, you can get it up a little bit. And every move the expedition made was being dissected by the Canadian media. It turned base camp into a pressure cooker. Almost everything that could go wrong for the Canadian team has gone wrong. The weather, even by Everest standards, has been awful. The monsoon season, which usually ends in August, is still hanging on, bringing snow and avalanches. There have been accidents, bad ones, with three Sherpas and one Canadian dead, several other climbers injured. And for a few days this week, after nearly half the team quit the climb, it looked as if the whole expedition might be called off. And the only sensible thing to me that came out of the discussions was that there was already enough supplies that had been carried through the dangerous icefall that we could move up through the icefall and continue on with a smaller team. That basically, we had had a shipwreck you know, with these accidents and the survivors uh, decided to change their course. You know, we've got all this equipment here, and you know, we've taken all this time, all these years to, to plan and put this expedition together. And it's terrible that four people have died up to this point. But inside, I still feel like I've got a lot yet to give, and I think our chances are reasonable. I really think it'd be such a waste if we turned around and left now, but I've given it another try. That's why I'm staying. Although desperate to climb, Laurie wasn't with Pat and the remaining expedition members who had moved up to Camp 1. He was stuck below the icefall, nursing broken ribs. My Sherpa got snagged on a bridge, a high bridge, so I took my pack off, crawled out, unsnagged the rope for him, and when he turned, a snow stake hit me in the face that was in his pack and knocked me off, and I fell into a crevasse. And I landed on a, uh, an ice block with four my ribs. I was wrapped in tape, from the tent, and that's where I lied for two weeks. Laurie tells Natasha how he defied orders and climbed alone through the icefall, which had been closed to prevent further loss of life. At one point, there was no way to go any further. And I uh, tried for an hour, and then I gave up, what headed was, back down. What happened? That bridge was broken, and it didn't reach the other side of the crevasse, so it was like a diving board, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get around it. So what did you do? I turned around and headed down, but then my conscience got the better of me, and, <laughs> and uh, I went back up, and I uh, rigged it so that at least if the if I failed, I would still be attached to something, and I could mm -hmm. probably crawl up the rope with some mechanical ascenders if I didn't get too, too injured. And I had to go to the end of the broken ladder and jump off it like a diving board to get to the other side. And what I, did you? You obviously made it. Well, I made it, but what was holding me on was the side where my ribs were broken, so it was really painful. Lori joined the remaining team members at Camp One, all of them ready for a fresh start. Let me turn that off and I turn this back on it. Oh, how do we get this? Okay, and there we go.
there we go. Thank you so much. So I wanted to show you just that short clip. So you had an idea of, of how <clears throat> there wasn't a lot of support at this stage, sponsors, 162 sponsors, the biggest one, Air Canada. Uh, they wanted us to quit because four people have been killed. It was looking like it was an embarrassment. And all the children and the wives of the men that were on the mountain, girlfriends, they, they thought it was horrible. Four people had died up to this point. And uh, <clears throat> the only thing that kept us going on the mountain was the drive of those that remained. I'm not trying to make a bigger deal of it. I'm trying to say that the support that we hoped we had wasn't there. So it was up to us to make it work with what we had left. So <clears throat> when I, when we got approval to head back up the mountain, I had the bandages removed from my chest by the Camp Sadis, Dave Reed. And when they were taken off, I still couldn't inflate my right lung. So the one doctor we had left said, you gotta go to a hospital. There's one six days from here. Get an x-ray, come back with good news. Otherwise I can't let you back up the mountain. So I headed off. I packed up a bag and I went off to get to the hospital. And the other members reopened the route from base camp to camp one, pulling out rope from six, seven feet of snow that had covered it up in other places, fishing for bridges that had collapsed and fallen down into a crevasse when the crevasse opened up, fishing for them with ice axes tied to the end of their climbing ropes. On the right side, you can see what, what happens when a crevasse closes up, twisting and contorting an aluminum ladder like it's a piece of licorice. And eventually, they pushed through, made it to the site of Camp 1, and then pushed up to finally start establishing Camp 2. Now, in the interim, I made it out in four days rather than six, got to the hospital the same day the machine, the x-ray machine broke, so I learned nothing about my condition except the doctor who examined me said, yeah, you got broken ribs. I thanked him and I took off to head back to base camp. Now, a uh, day and a half out of base camp, I managed to reach base camp by radio, and I was told by the um, base camp manager, Peter Spear, you better get up here, Scrizz, they're gonna close the ice fall. So I hustled my butt, I made it in eight hours, and then the news came down that the ice fall was being closed. So I pretended I never got the news, packed up my bag, and took off that night. When Bill March heard that I, I hadn't stayed there, he said nobody was to follow me because it was too dangerous for anyone to be coming through. So what I was describing to my daughter was trying to find my way through that maze of broken bridges to get up to the side of Camp 1. And it was, uh, it, was the, it was the critical point on the expedition for me. Had I turned around at that point, all the things that would follow would never have happened. So it was part of that giving more than 100%. It was, you know, was it 100% to go there, try to rig it the way as best I could, and then decide it was too dangerous, or was it to go back up and actually make the jump, try, and suffer the consequences. Hopefully I wasn't gonna die. So I made it, and I made it to the site of Camp 1, and there was a handful of Sherpas and two Canadians. So our job became one of dismantling the bridges from behind us to send up the mountain. So in essence, burning our bridges behind us as we moved up the mountain. Now it may not sound like a great strategy, but I can tell you this, it sure raised the level of commitment up on everyone's part. And now you couldn't just go, ah, it's getting too hard, I quit, and turn around and walk off the mountain, because you couldn't get off the mountain. The only way we could get off is when we descended together as a team. So it really changed the nature of the climb. To put it into perspective, base camp is at the bottom of the screen. Camp one is located here. The main team, the majority of the people that are on the mountain, not the two thirds of the Sherpas that stayed low, but the one third that were willing to go and the 14 Canadians, the majority of them were up here at the site of camp two. So we were sending gear up and eventually we were gonna now, the route had changed. We weren't gonna try to climb the south face, the southwest face. We were now gonna go and do Lotse establish Camp 3 around here, 23,000, traverse this avalanche slope, link up to this rock rib known as the Geneva Spur, climb the Geneva Spur, traverse into the South Call, put Camp 4 in there at 26,000, and then make a bid for the summit of Everest along the southeast ridge of Everest. This is Camp 2 at 21,000 feet <coughs> the day I arrived. I wasn't looking forward to it because I was sure I was gonna get really chewed up by the expedition leader. When I arrived, he came up to me, threw his arms around me and said, am I ever glad to see you? And I pulled back and I said, I thought you didn't want me up here. And he took me to the side and he said, Lori, for the rest of my life I have to live with the knowledge that my decisions led to the death of four men. He said, if I'd have told you I need you up here and you got killed coming up, he said, it would have been the straw that broke my back. And that's why I had to tell you to stay. 
And then after about 20 seconds of silence, he goes, but knowing you like I do, I knew you'd disobey me, and I'm glad you're here. <laughs> now let's get this job done and get a Canadian on the summit. That's what he said. And so a lot of guys didn't get along with him. He was a British extract, military, kind of a tough guy. But I was brought up around military people, so I know how to take orders, and I know how to deal with people like that. You just had to be as strong as they were. And so I got along with Bill. And one of the reasons I stayed, even with broken ribs, was he asked me to promise that he needed to know who would stay to the end of the trip. Good or bad, success or unsuccess, he wanted to know who was going to be there right to the end. And I said, I'd be there. So that was part of me living up to the word that I gave him. In the background, you can see the face of Lotse. And the next picture is taken at 23,000 feet on the face of Lotse as we're digging into the side of the slope to establish some tents there, the ones I showed you in base camp. I'm showing you this picture so you can see how steep it is outside the door of your tent. It's about 60 degrees. So when you get up in the middle of the night to pee, you better make sure you're tied in because usually we sleep with down booties on. You step outside, that snow fills in from your level platform and it becomes rock hard. And there's been many people that have done exactly that, stepped out in the night to pee, slipped and fell to their death. So when you're up there, you've got to pay attention to everything. All the details matter when you're up high. Uh, this is what it looks like in these tents up high. That's the expedition leader, Bill March. He led from the front, didn't ask us to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. This is what it looks like. Four men are crammed in this space. There's stoves hanging from the ceiling all over. Why? For heat? No, not at all. It's cold. You just get used to it. For melting snow and ice to get liquid because we've got to get so much fluid in all these guys. And outside, it's around 20 below zero, maybe dropping to 25 below zero, windy. We had the right gear, we had the right clothing, and I was brought up in the 50s and 60s. But by that I mean, it used to be cold in Alberta. I remember once when it was 37 days, it never got warmer than 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And that's what we grew up in as kids, and we played. And, and so the cold didn't bother some of us, didn't bother me. What bothered me was we we're climbing above or entering into this area known as the death zone. You're so high on the mountain that human cells don't replicate normally. And so if you're healthy, you get sick. If you're sick, you don't get better. If you cut yourself, it doesn't heal. And the idea now is you've got to get somebody to the top before the health of your remaining team is broken. And so on the morning of October the 4th, seven Sherpas, two Canadians and myself set off to try to establish Camp 4, the high camp, and if we had enough strength to make a bid for the summit the next day. There had been two unsuccessful attempts prior to that, and I was asked to, to do this, and I said, well, couldn't I take another week? I want to see how high I can get without oxygen. And the expedition leader said to me, we're not here to see how high you can get on Everest without oxygen. We're here to put a Canadian on the summit, and I want you to go with Lloyd Gallagher and Dave Reed and the seven Sherpas I picked out and establish Camp 4 and try to go to the summit the next day if you have the strength. So that's what we did. This picture's taken at 9.30 a.m. on the morning of October the 4th. We left at 4 a.m. from Camp 2. I'm passing through Camp 3 here, picking up more oxygen bottles that are in my pack. This picture taken at around 10.45 a.m. That's where we left at 4 a.m., Camp 2. Camp 3 is below and to the left, and we're moving up the Geneva Spur on fixed rope that we put out there over the previous 10 to 12 days. This picture taken at 25,800 feet as we, we've topped off on the Geneva Spur and are traversing into the South Col where we're going to establish our final camp. As these Sherpas moved below me, I panned my camera to the right, looked up, and took this picture of the South Summit of Everest. Now the true summit lies three, 400 feet higher along a cornice ridge. But this right-hand profile of the mountain is called the Southeast Ridge of Everest. And if any of you read the book Into Thin Air, a story of an incident that happened in 1996 where a dozen people died on Everest and the majority of them died on this section in one night. That's the section we're going to try to climb to get to the summit. To the left of the Sherpa's left knee is the South Col. And an hour and 15 minutes later, I managed to get two tents up there. I kept two men with me, Sundari Sherpa and Lakwadorje Sherpa, sent the other Sherpas down. The two Sherpas and I crawled into one tent and melted snow and ice for four and a half hours awaiting the arrival of the other two Canadians. And when they didn't show, I got out of the tent at 6.30, radioed down, what the hell's going on? Where are the guys? And they said, well, they haven't returned here. You're going to have to go out and search for them. 
So I crawled back in the tent, told the Sherpas, we got to gear up. We got to go find these guys. So by the time we got out of the tent, it was pitch black. And the temperature was 44 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And the winds were around 60 miles per hour. So it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And we were out until 11 at night. We located both men. One man was trapped at Camp 3. His oxygen system had failed. We got him on the radio. His radio couldn't reach down below. And so he would spend the night there and descend the next day. The other man we found 600 feet below us, he'd run out of oxygen. We got him on fresh oxygen, got him up. I carried his pack, got him up to one of the tents, got him in the tent in a bag, hot liquid in his body, fresh oxygen. He recuperated. But by 11, 11.30, we realized, okay, if we're going to make a bid the next day, how much oxygen we got left? And we only had a, three bottles. We only had enough for three of us to make the attempt. So the question was, who's going to go? Two Sherpas and one Canadian? Or two Canadians and one Sherpa? It was a Canadian expedition. So logically, you'd think two Canadians and one Sherpa. But Dave said to me, Laurie, you're moving faster than me. If, if I can't make it to the top and have to descend, I'm going to need somebody to be with me. So if you and I try with one Sherpa, the Sherpa will have to go with me. He said, you'll be alone up there. I think you should go with two Sherpas. There's a better chance all three of you will make it. And this may be the only shot the team has. So I, I said, OK. I put my knife away, which I was holding to the hose on his auction. And uh, we, we got a couple hours of sleep. And uh, we were up at 2 AM. And at 2.20, the stove in the other tent blew up, and the Sherpas had no stove. Uh, when you change gas cartridges, gas escapes in them. And sometimes the friction from a, a, a nylon garment will ignite it. So we had to use our stove to get them enough fluid for the day. So we didn't get out of the tent till 4 a.m. And it took 15 minutes to get our packs on and get our oxygen masks on. So we started at 4.15. I'm only going to show you one picture on the way to the summit. And this will give you an idea what it was like. We climbed for two and a half hours in darkness. And then we made it to the south summit. Oh, what time? Around 8.30. I had to stop give my thermos to the Sherpas, told them drink, and I had to take my boots off and warm my toes. I couldn't feel my toes. It was so cold. I got my boots back on again, took a quick sip of tea. We started moving again. This is the last section leading to the top. This is the Hillary Step. It's about an 80-foot technical rock pitch, and then two more hundred feet or 150 feet to the summit. This is a cornice. And you know what cornices are. Winds coming from the right to left, Snow is deposited, creates a frozen wave of snow. Okay, what's below that? A uh, 10,000 foot drop down the east to the East Rongbuk Glacier down the north face of Everest. So this hangs out over the north face. So you might wonder then why in the world are you walking on the top of it? Why don't you walk on this side of it or climb? So we tried, it's hard to see with this screen, but a slab avalanche almost carried us to our death on this side. So we couldn't, we had to move along the top. So we shortened the rope so it was about 30 feet between us, and we agreed that if one man slipped and fell off one side, the only way to save them was to throw yourself off the other. Like if this guy starting to rock climb now slipped, or this guy coming up behind him slipped and fell as he was climbing, he would rip that guy off, two guys would be tumbling down, and I would have about two and a half seconds to throw myself off the left side. So why I'm explaining this is so that you get that I don't think that this is the kind of activity for everybody. Some people might find that, that this is like a nightmare rather than a dream come true. For the two men I was with, Lakpa Dorje and Sundari Sherpa, and myself, we did fine. We were OK. We knew that if we had to jump off one side or the other, the rope would hold. We knew how to get back up the rope. We have mechanical devices to allow ourselves to do that. We knew the area. And so we were OK. And we actually set a world record, five hours and 15 minutes after we left the, the high camp, Sundari Sherpa, Lakwadorje Sherpa and myself stood on the summit of Everest at 9.30 a.m. on the morning of October the 5th, 1982. This made Sundari the first man in the world to have climbed Everest three times. The time previous to this, two years before, the two people he was climbing with, both of them died. I met one of them. I found the woman lying face down in the snow. I found her corpse. Last time he saw her, he was trying to save her life, and she died in his arms, and then he continued the descent. He lost portions of both his feet on that climb. This was the third time he would go to the summit of Mount Everest. He was one tough cookie. He took his oxygen mask on, off on the summit. I did the same, and we just breathed ambient air. This Sherpa Lakwadorje 
he was having a hard time, so he kept breathing his oxygen. Not a good thing, because he would run out of it on the descent and pass out. We stayed on the summit for about a half an hour. And in case you wonder, well, what's it like on the summit of Everest? Well, you're close to 30,000 feet above sea level. You can see two to 300 kilometers in any given direction. If you look, not on this angle, but where the sun was coming up, you can see the slight curvature of the earth. So it was pretty unique being in that, that place. You could probably be hard pressed to find a more dangerous place to be than on the summit of Mount Everest, but we had some good things working for us. The winds were reasonable, 30 kilometers per hour. The temperature was tolerable, 30 below. We were equipped properly. We did okay. So how big is the summit? It's about the size of a coffee table. Enough room for two men to sit and one man to stand. Uh, people wonder, well, what did you do? You know, jump for joy. You've all seen footage on television, you know, of all the, the stuff that happens on the summit. I'm not emotionally centered, so I don't show my emotions that, that easily. And so it was the acknowledgement that we made it, the realistic awareness that we're not off this thing yet. And for this, this ascent to mean anything, we got to get off alive. And so I thought, if I get off this mountain alive, I'll have the rest of my life to reflect on what it means. So I didn't have any joy and all the rest of it. And the two Sherpas, one of them lit a cigarette and the other one was eating a bit of food. And that's, that's honestly, that's what was going on on the top. There was no evidence that anyone had been there before. There was no tripods, flags, anything. And kids always ask me, you know, did you see any animals up there? And the answer is yes. A raven followed me to the summit of Everest. And when I got to the top, the raven landed at my feet and looked at me. And so my native friends here in Alberta tell me, well, he's on your totem. The raven's a messenger. He brings you what it is that you're seeking. And every time I've been back to Everest, the ravens are always around me. So I have a good relationship with ravens. And uh, we only stayed 30 minutes because we, the weather starts changing rapidly. And it was time to get going down. We started the descent, but I stopped, climbed back to the summit, and picked up a couple of rocks because I felt I'm supposed to bring something back. And uh, then we started the descent. And halfway down, the man in the middle lost consciousness and fell, and we caught him on the rope. We, the first Sherpa gave him his oxygen, and we continued down. And then nearing our high camp, the middle guy and, my, and myself fell into a crevasse, and the first guy saved us by holding onto the rope. And so the safety systems worked. We made it to high camp. We had a cup of tea from Dave Reed, who had prepped it for us before we got there. And now, without wasting any time, we vacated the camp, left everything in place, and started the long descent to get back down to Camp 2. This picture taken at 8.30 at night, uh, myself in the background in a tent, Sundari Sherpa, Lakwadorje Dorje Sherpa. We stayed up till 2 in the morning, day briefing, and then the next day, another group of seven carried to high camp. Four spent the night up there. Meanwhile, we sent the message up by shortwave to Kathmandu that we made it. And that was sent by satellite back to Canada. And then the next day, all Canadians knew that a Canadian had made it to the summit of Everest. Oh, and you might wonder, oh, I'll tell you next here. Two days later, at 11.30 a.m., Lakpa Sinning, Pemba Dorje, and Pat Morrill made it to the summit of Everest. Now, this photograph made Pat, the first Canadian ever to have his picture properly taken on the summit of Everest, because I carried two cameras with me. One worked, a Leica single lens reflex R4, and the other one, a Minox, failed. Because I handed the Minox to the two Sherpas, they took two pictures of me, I put it back in my pocket, and the camera failed. And I changed batteries in both cameras the night before going up. So there's no photos of me, and I didn't know that at the time. But back in Canada, when this film got developed, the picture we have of a Canadian on the summit is of the second Canadian to reach the summit. And I always thought that that was pretty cool the way it worked out. I got the distinction of being the first. Pat got the distinction of having his image remembered as a Canadian on the summit of Everest. So in the end, it worked out just fine. If you're wondering what they were thinking on the summit, they were thinking the same as we were, which is it's not over till we're off. And for me, I could not accept that we'd done the trip and it was successful, separate from the four men who died, I couldn't accept it until I took this photograph of the last man taking the last few steps off the Kumbu Icefall. And um, this was Dave Reed, the man who gave me the summit, or gave me the opportunity to go to the summit and become the first Canadian. And I had tremendous respect for him for a number of reasons. He maintained a sense of humor throughout the trip. 
to the last day of the trip, his manners were impeccable. He took out his water bottle, he always offered it to others before he drank. If he brewed up tea, he always offered others tea before he took his portion. And separate from all that, he was the only guy in the expedition that had the forethought to make sure that product from one of our sponsors, Seagram's, was left over by the end of the expedition. So Seagram's gave us 4,000 bucks and a couple of cases of Vio. Well, the Vio disappeared in the first three weeks of trekking into base camp. And then he stole a bottle and buried it in the glacier. So when we got off the mountain, he went to this secret hiding place, dug it out, and then lined all of us up that had gone to the up high on the mountain. Not just gone to the summit, but had gone up and worked on the mountain. And then he made each of us take a sip from this bottle. And although I don't like the taste of whiskey, I prefer rum, to this day that remains the best drink I ever had in my life when that trip was over. Because that was a stiff price to pay if four men killed. And it saddened all of us. <clears throat> Uh, we got cleaned up eventually, and I posed for a photograph after a long day briefing session with the two men I went to the summit with. Sundari Sherpa, 26 years of age, three times to the top. Lakhmadorje Sherpa, 26, three, first time to the summit. Myself, 32 years old, first time to the summit. Eight days later, we walked out 100 miles to an airstrip called Lukla, and we're getting ready to fly back to Kathmandu and then home to Canada. One, less Im one more image to show you. Two months after I got back, one of the men who walked off, his name was Jim Alzinga, a good friend of mine, I was just talking to him the other day, he lives in Canmore now, and we were ice climbing last week. He called me and said, would you be willing to go back to Everest and try it again with those of us that walked off? And he knew my history with Outward Bound. I'd worked 12 years for Outward Bound in Canada and the United States, taught over 46 courses, the essence of which, each one a month long, is the willingness to give your best. And when you fall down and fail at something, to find the courage to stand back up again and try again. And so he knew I could say nothing but, of course. So he flew to China and somehow got permission from the Chinese Mountaineering Association for us to attempt the north face of Everest. Arrived back in Canada and said, okay, we got three years to put this trip together and we got to do a better job than we did in 82. So he said, I want this expedition to be a lightweight attempt on the mountain. So we're going to call it Everest Light. And to that end, we funded it for 300,000 instead of 3 million. We took 12 climbers instead of 67, two of whom were women. We went with five tons of gear instead of 27 tons of gear. We attempted it without any Sherpa support whatsoever. We took seven bottles of oxygen instead of 300. And uh, in March of 1986, we got dropped off 22 kilometers from the base of the mountain. From the north side, you can drive in. And then 72 days after we started the climb, on May 21st, 1986, we placed two of our members on the summit. One of them was uh, the youngest member of our 82 trip, Dwayne Congdon, and the other person was a young woman named Sharon Wood, who became the first woman on this side of the planet to climb Mount Everest. Now, I've mentioned her name a few times. I do that because when I met her, she was 16 years old. She was a student at Outward Bound, and I was her rock climbing instructor. So to see her come from being a student to the first woman on this side of the planet to climb Mount Everest just filled my heart with joy. And it's on that note that I wanted to end this here tonight. But I wanted to tell you before you leave here, I was hoping that <clears throat> one thing might stay with you from this presentation. And, and you probably already know it yourselves. You know, here in Canada, just like individuals, we all have our fatal flaws. My fatal flaws, there's seven that Tibetans believe. Stubbornness, arrogance, self-deprecation, impatience, martyrdom, greed, and self-destruction. And we'll have one that becomes our stumbling block throughout our life, and we have to learn how to, how to get over it, how to transform it, how to neutralize it to be able to realize our full potential. Well, mine's impatience, <clears throat> but our country, Canada, has one as well, and it's self-deprecation. And I think most of us know that. We don't think highly enough of ourselves as Canadians when we compare ourselves to others. And the ironic truth is, not only are we equal to anyone in any country on this planet, but in so many ways we excel. And our brothers to the south, they're in that same dynamic. And I always admired Americans because they're proud of their country. And, and that pride is, a, is a, an indication that their fatal flaw is a little bit of arrogance. And the two of us can learn from each other, Canadians and Americans. And I say that because I did this expedition because I, I wanted to let some Canadians feel proud. That, that there's Canadians that are willing to go out and try something 
not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And to be willing to give their best and work together with others to make something happen. So I got the distinction of being the first, but I got to the summit standing on the shoulders of all those that set the stage, not just the climbers on the expedition, but those that raised the money back here in Canada, the high school students that packed the food, all the companies that were willing to support us in trying to do this. So I was hoping that at the end of the presentation, maybe some of you will look back at 1982 and, and see this story as something that was a moment in our history that you could be proud to be a Canadian, because I think that whatever we showed on the mountain is a part of all of us. And every member of that expedition came from Western Canada. Everyone came from Alberta. I know I shouldn't be proud like that, but I, I'm proud to be an Albertan, and I love this province. And I think the mountains that we have to the west, they bring out something in us as human beings. They, they bring out that resiliency <clears throat> that you need to be able to play in that environment. And I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's no less the same down here in southern Alberta, making a living from the land. So I will end by once again apologizing for those of you that had to wait. I'm going to hang around if any of you had questions. I know you want to get going. Should I ask, are there any questions you wanted to ask as a group here before we shut this down? Any questions about women on expeditions, money, you know, why you do it, why you don't do it? Yeah? Any questions? Yes? Excellent. The, the question is, what did you do with all those oxygen bottles? Did you leave them up there? Seems like a lot of junk on the mountain. A picture that I did not include in this slideshow is a picture I took at the high camp, uh, the South Call. And in it, you could see about 500 empty oxygen bottles. So we took off as much as we could carry when we came off. The ugly truth is, though the mountain was dirtier for us having been there than before we came. Now, when we went back in 86, we left the mountain cleaner than we found it. We took everything off. Okay, that's the bad news about 82. Here's the good news. Between 1982 and 1990, <clears throat> as the internet started to expand, some Sherpas discovered, what's that website where you can put up things for auction? What's that called? eBay. eBay. They discovered eBay. And they noticed that books and paraphernalia about Everest really commanded a high a high kind of figure. So a couple of them carried a few auction bottles down from the South Call that had the stamp on it from the 1953 British expedition in which Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay got to the top. They put it on eBay and figured they'd get 50 to 100 bucks for it and the person who buys it would pay shipping. They didn't realize that there are thousands of armchair mountaineers that are fascinated by Everest. And when they saw, I think that first bottle went for $500 or $700, once the bulb lit, they realized that the South Call and everything that's up there had value in the eyes of people who, who read about Everest and, and were fascinated by it. So over the next 10 to 12 years, the mountain got cleaned up by these entrepreneurial Sherpas who started bringing stuff off the mountain and putting it on eBay. And so the mountain, when I was on it last, 2006, was much cleaner than any time we were on it in 81 and 82. Now, things have shifted a bit. They're not as strict on the Chinese side. Uh, but now less people are attempting Everest from the Chinese side and more are attempting Everest just from the south side one season a year, and that's in the springtime. So there is, with the numbers of people that are up there, it's still a concern about the stuff that gets taken up on Everest. But what you do when you go on an expedition, I think each person has to put a deposit down equal to the amount of gear they're bringing in. And they have to show an equal amount and they have a formula to calculate it of garbage that you bring off. All human waste has to be brought down off the mountain. So they're, they're applying some of the, the techniques we use here to maintain our resources like the Rockies and our, our parks. But it's a third world country on the south and it's China on the north. And neither country is really you know, renowned for those, you know, for respect in that area. So I'm sad to say the mountain has probably taken a bit of abuse from the numbers of people that are up there. As I said, close to 10,000 people had climbed Everest. When I went back in 2006, I did a little ceremony with my daughter on Kalapatar opposite Everest. And in that ceremony, I, I asked the spirit of the mountain, so what's happening to you with all these people? 
And now you might think it's my imagination, but what I got was this, that long after we cease to exist as a race on this planet, that mountain's still gonna be there. It's gonna outlive us all. And so I think it's got, it's got something that'll stand us puny little humans trying to climb up it. And that may be whitewashing it, but does that answer your question? Honestly? Okay. And uh, if, yes, you had a question in the back? How many times can an ox haul? How many times what? Can ox, oxen haul? How many times can oxen? How many times can an oxen haul? How much weight? How much weight? Oh, those, those uh, yaks. Yeah, I think they carried 100 to 120 kilograms balanced on each side. And why, why I mentioned them was that the first time I went into Everest Base Camp, I got lost and I had, uh, I had altitude sickness and I barely made it to, to camp. And I was there to use the radio. I was coming from another expedition on the other side of Everest trying to climb Lotse, Sister Peak to Everest. Nupse, sorry. And uh, I asked the Sherpas in Base Camp Everest, what the hell did I do wrong? I had a map, I had a compass, I was following the cairns, and they said, that's your mistake. The cairns, the piles of rocks that are built, they shift all over and move because of the heat, things change on the glacier. And I said, well, then how the hell do you know the right way to get in? It's nine miles. <coughs> and they said, you look for the yak done. And I go, why? He said, the yaks know how to get in here and they know how to get out. So if you follow the trail of shit, you'll find your way to Base Camp and find your way out again. And so the next day I left to go back to Nupse Base Camp and I, I got a terrible headache and I got, I got mixed up and I lost myself in the thing. And then I remember what the Sherpas told me, so I looked for the yak dung, I found it, and then I, I managed to get off. And those, those yaks go all the way in from the edge of the glacier to Base Camp without direction, on their own, cross streams, jump over little crevasses, wait to get unloaded, get fed, get watered, then they walk all the way back out and wait on the edge of the glacier. That's why I was saying they're smarter than most of the climbers I met when I was over there. So nothing but respect for them. Plus they use their fur for clothing, they use their milk to make cheese <clears throat> and to sweeten their teas, and then eventually when they're slaughtered they eat their meat. So they're uh, an unbelievable animal and they're beautiful, beautiful creatures. If, if, yes, you had one there back? Is the magic of Everest diminishing because so many people are, are climbing it now? Somebody asked me just last week, how many times you climbed Yam Nuska? It's one of the first mountains you come to as you go into uh, the Bull Corridor west of Calgary. So it's called Mount Laurie on the maps. It has nothing to do with me. It's a missionary that it was named after the uh, turn of the last century, 1900. It's called Yam Nuska Wall of Stone, Lakota for Wall of Stone. My daughter calculated recently I probably climbed it 1,800 times. And uh, this person last week said, don't you get tired of coming up here to Yam? I don't do the same route. You can hike up it from different routes. There's over 100 routes up the 1,000-foot base of this mountain. And I said to this person, no, every time I go to Yam Nuska, it's always new because I respect it completely and I show reverence for the mountain. And each time is a new experience. So has it taken the magic off for me, the number of people that have climbed Everest? The answer is no. The last time I was there, it was just as hard, if not harder, than when we did it last time in 1986. This is 2006 with the British military. My daughter asked me two years ago if I wanted to do Everest, would you, would you take me up at that? And I said, well, I'll have to stay fit. If that's the case, you better make up your mind in the next 10 years. You know, I might get to be too old one day. And if I went back, I would have nothing but respect and, and see nothing but the magic of that mountain when I, went, when I would go back especially if I took my daughter. Has it become something different for others? The answer is yes, it has. It, it tends to be something that many people put on their bucket list and look at it just as a physical exercise, not to diminish the accomplishment of climbing Everest, but it's a magical place, and it's much more than just 40 or 50 days of hard physical effort. People get transformed from being on that mountain, and it never will cease to be magical for me. Is it... Has it changed in the eyes of many? The fact that it's guided has changed it. Now, more and more people can do it. it. It's in the realm of possibility. Even if you haven't dedicated your life to climbing and you're not a skilled mountaineer, if you get fit and you're focused and you're determined, you have a chance of getting up Everest. Do I think that's a bad thing? I'm biased. I'm a mountain guide. That's what I do for a living. I guide people in the mountains. So I think people have a right to make a, a decision or a choice like that. 
But like many of you probably know, if you go into any natural environment without respect, you can get hurt. You know, John Wayne had that old saying, you know, life's tough. It's tough if you're stupid. Well, you don't go to Everest unless you've exposed yourself to some mountains ahead of time. Practice in the Rockies, here in Canada, down in the United States. Go to the Andes before going to Everest. To just decide you want to go climb Everest, that's a pretty risky endeavor. It's not that it hasn't been done by people who haven't climbed anything else, but anyone wanting to go to Everest, I suggest they spend a year or two preparing by getting to climb in the Canadian Rockies and going down to South America before going to Mount Everest. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now, if any of you had any lingering questions, I'm probably going to sit down and have a drink and sit down. So I'm going to be hanging around, and, uh, and if any of you wanted to come up and... Yeah, you had one more? Go ahead. In your opinion, what's uh, the most technically difficult mountain? What's the most technically difficult mountain in the world? I'll just finish this question. Okay. Um, there's a mountain down in southern Chile. Okay, I go to Argentina every year. I'm leaving in three weeks to guide Aconcagua, the highest mountain on this side of the planet. It's 23,000 feet high. It's on the Argentinian, Chilean border. But further south, in southern Chile, there's a mountain there called Cerro Torre. And it starts at, at sea level, and it's 12,000 feet high. And on the summit, it's a vertical pillar, a vertical pinnacle of granite going up eight, 9,000 feet. And then the top is an ice cream cone cover of frozen ice that's 600 feet thick. It, it looks impossible, but it's been done many times. To me, that's one of the most technically challenging climbs around, is going down and climbing in, in Patagonia. On the 8,000 meter peaks, there's one mountain that has a terrible reputation, and that's K2, the second highest mountain in the world. And it's got a reputation of taking many Everest climbers Oh, they've done the highest in the world. Makes logical sense to go try to do the second highest. And so many die going to K2. It's, is it technically difficult? It's more than technically difficult. It's got weather patterns that can trap you on the mountain. And so much like driving in bad conditions on the highway on the Trans-Canada, there's some mountains that you really want to be thinking carefully about before you commit to because more, the high, a higher percentage of people die on those than die on Everest. So now it's less than a fraction of 1%. Those that go to climb Everest, less than 1% die on the mountain. But K2, the odds are again in that one to six. For every six climbers that go there, someone dies on it. Pretty rough, pretty terrible. And by the way, I, I guess I was supposed to mention that the, the optional item was, I donated a book and a poster I'll sign, a book that I wrote called To the Top of Everest. It's for kids 8 to 14 years of age, a poster from the Everest 86 trip, and one day of uh, guiding in the Canadian Rockies. Meaning, I'll take you, whoever wanted to bid on that, up a mountain that maybe you don't feel you've got enough skill to do on your own, but I'll take you and a friend on a climb uh, during the summer months when the days are nice and long, 12 to 14 hours, and we'll do a real mountain in the Canadian Rockies. So that's a package that's out there to be bid on. I think that's what you wanted me to mention, right? And uh, yes. Oh, and my friend Mort Molyneux, give him a wave, Mort, would you? Mort worked for this in 1982 on the Everest 82 trip. I can't believe we're both still alive, Mort. This is great. <laughs> and we both live in Alberta. So Mort has volunteered to film the day in the mountains. He'll be a part of it, and he'll film the whole thing so he'll have a record of it. So that's that auctionable item of a day in the Rockies with me. And you just got to get to Calgary. That's it and then I'll cover it from there. So thank you very much, and hopefully I'll get a chance to meet some of you afterwards. Thank you again.